All right. <clears throat> I wish to extend greetings to you all in the precious name of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Greetings to everyone that's listening. And, uh, Lord willing, next week we will try just to resume uh, services here. Things are kind of loosening up a little bit, so we'll just plan on, unless we something changes or hear something different, we'll, we'll uh, just return back to normal services. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you for your goodness, and for your mercy. We just ask your blessing on this time together. Lord, we just ask that you would fill us with your spirit, give us wisdom. Lord, help us have understanding, Father. Lord, fill us with mercy and grace and peace, Lord. Again, we just thank you for all that you do for us. Open our hearts to your word. Guide our thoughts, Father. Again, we thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. I want to uh, uh, open our Bibles to... We're going to read some in Philippians. Uh, chapter 4. Beginning in verse 1. But I want to take one verse from from John John chapter 1 and verse 14 talking about Jesus it says and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory Glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And what I want to talk about this morning is the full of grace part, the full of grace and truth. And whenever we look at this verse, it talks about the Word being flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father. And it says, full of grace and truth. And the reason I want to talk about grace this morning is because it'll fit in here with a little bit, but grace is the opposite of what we uh, see so often in church, in the world. It's the world is not full of grace and it's not full of tree, truth. And it's the opposite of Christ. And I just want us to think about that just a little bit. Grace is one of those words that uh, had several messages talked about hijacked words. And grace is one of those words. Uh, the theologians have turned grace into a doctrinal word to where it just means just their... I think the most common thought that's been translated or talked about or uh, has permeated religion about grace is unmerited favor. And I think that just does the word such a disservice because grace is just such a, a beautiful word when you think of something that's graceful. You don't think of unmerited favor. You think of something that's just uh, flowing and just beautiful. When you see, you think of something, a bird that's flying gracefully, it's just floating and just, everything is just so smooth and just so uh, pleasant looking. And yet, today we've reduced it just to a doctrinal word of, unmerited favor and it just it means so little to what the word really is about and we see this life of Jesus and the God manifest in the flesh and one of the very things to describe this in the flesh this God in the flesh was 
full of grace and truth. And we just think of that word, and not necessarily in, in fluid movements, but in life. A life that's just full of grace and not a physical, you know, a lot of times we talked about the physical element of grace, but the spiritual element of a grace in a person's life. You see, when we talk about <clears throat> eternity and being together with God in eternity, <clears throat> it's, we're not going to be there because of our doctrine, but whenever we look at heaven and what it really means, it's about who people are, not just their doctrines. I mean, whenever we look at heaven, you know, I've asked people before, you know, when you die, what, what will you be like? And the Bible talks about it, about as a tree falls, so shall it not lie. And I've mentioned the idea of when somebody thinks that when they die, they're just going to be changed dramatically. And everything's going to be just wonderful. Well, we're still going to be who we are. You know, we may have a new body. And there may be a new place. And I've asked people this question, you know, if heaven is a perfect place and everything's just wonderful there, and you have a new body, but they put you in it, what are we going to have? Some of the circumstances that we face and the things that we go through will be gone, but at the heart of it, it'll be who we are that will pass through into eternity. And one of those things, instead of just being a doctrinal thing, that will be required, I believe, is grace grace not just the word but the person and i think to be like jesus is to be like is to be full of grace and to be able to fit with him in eternity will be someone full of grace and truth you know there's a lot of people think they have truth mr a.w tozer said one time that people that a lot of people have truth and they can be straight as a gun barrel and that's truth or two plus two is four that's truth what did that do for you but he talked about the gun barrel someone can be straight as a gun barrel in truth and just as empty and that's uh, without the grace truth is worth less it's deceitful it's even uh, it's there's no value in it all by itself and that this verse it brings out the grace and truth and if a person doesn't have the grace with the truth there's just there's nothing there let's turn to Philippians chapter 4 <laughs> verse 1 it says therefore my beloved brethren whom I long to see, my joy and crown. In this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Eurodia, and I urge Scythiche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help those women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement, also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay, it talks about these two people in verse 2. <clears throat> Herodia and Saitache. To live in harmony in the Lord. Evidently, just reading that, when I just read through it, there has evidently been some disharmony somewhere because he's telling them to live in harmony. And I just want to remind us again that you know a lot of times we think of the perfect church and the church the perfect church would be made up of perfect perfect people 
And they're, but that's not the way it is. The perfect church knows how to love each other even with differences, even with disagreements. And here these two were evidently had a time that they didn't live in harmony. And yet, even with this, Paul doesn't disqualify them. He just encourages them to live in harmony. And that's, that is a little bit with what I'm talking about, about grace. To have grace, you have to learn to live with people that aren't always, you aren't always in harmony with, but be able to, to go through with that. One of the things that we talked a little about last week, and we look out in the world today how many problems there are in the world. There's mental problems, there's depression, there's all kinds of things going all around us, anxiety. And yet, if we have grace and some of these things that the Bible talks about, we won't have those other things. And I think that we live in the world that's, uh, that there is no negatives or there is no, uh, no uh, we live in a world that's a vacuum. If we don't have the good and the high qualities, the vacuum will pull in the bad ones. And, in a, and the way to avoid these bad things that are out here all around us is to fill ourselves with the good things that are available. We hear the story or remember the story about the man who had seven devils and, or that, and the, Jesus had cast them out and he was encouraged to fill himself because if the enemy or the devils would come back and find the place empty, they'd bring in a whole bunch more just like themselves. And so we are vessels and what we fill ourselves with is what we will be. And if we fill ourselves with bad things, there's no room for good things. We, we live in a world that, um, it's just amazing. The, one of the things that convinces me most that there is a God and that there is good is that there is evil. And good will triumph over evil if we pursue it. But it's nothing that's just going to be handed to us. We have to pursue those things. And that's one of the reasons I think that there's people that are disagreeable sometimes. That there's disharmony somewhere because whenever there is that disharmony or people that are disagreeable or things that are problems, that gives all of us an opportunity to apply these better things. We forget sometimes that we have to constantly pursue these things. In verse four it says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Here he begins to give us some, a recipe you know, if, we are, if we're full of anxiousness and anxiety and depression or pressed towards that, he gives us a recipe of how to overcome those things. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You know, we'll get to, uh, well, let me read on here and then I'll come back. It says, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is of good repute, 
If there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice in these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Here we have this recipe. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I, re uh, and again I say rejoice. In Thessalonians, it, it tells them to give thanks in all things. And I've just, I've thought about this just a little bit. Someone that is rejoicing and giving thanks in all things is not going to get depressed. If we're given thanks and living this life, there's no room for depression or discouragement. We all face it. We all find times whenever things began to look black, but they don't have to. If we have a, if we will cultivate a grateful heart, if we will foster gratefulness and thankfulness, there is no room for those other things. And I just want to encourage us to think about these things. One of the most graceful things that we can possess is a spirit of gratefulness. And with that gratefulness, that all of these other things, there's no room for all these bad things whenever we're full of gratefulness. And it's just such a simple thing, but yet how often do we actually cultivate those things in our heart and in our lives? You know, there's nothing that anyone, to be appreciated, to be uh, thanked. I mean, we all love that. And it, we see that it is a good thing. How much more should we be cultivating that towards the Lord and towards the brethren? And when we do those things, there's promises. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. I mean, you know, a lot of times we think that we've got to be so rough and got to be so tough. But yet we can have a lot of that outside roughness and still have a gentle spirit about us. And I think that's Jesus. He was, he was uh, with John the Baptist was clothed with camel skins and just a rough appearance, but yet having a gentle spirit about him. Sometimes the things he had to say were pretty rough, but yet there was a gentle spirit about him. And I think that's part of that is, is the grace. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. When we get anxious, when we get depressed, when we get discouraged, that's the time to go to the Lord in prayer. Spending time in prayer we sat around all dark and gloomy and in the cloud and sometimes and have a pity party. Feel sorry for ourselves. And that's the time that the Bible teaches. And here's part of the recipe. Go to the Lord in prayer. With thankfulness. With rejoicing. You know, no matter how bad things look, 
You know, the little saying is there's a silver lining behind every cloud. No matter how dark things look, there are good things right in the middle of it. There's good things all around us. The little song, count your blessings, name them one by one. Whenever we begin to focus on those things, there's no room for that other stuff to be in there. There's no room for anxiousness or discouragement or depression. Whenever we're who we are supposed to be, a grateful, thankful, full of grace and mercy people. Those are the things that are going to transcend this flesh and bone and blood and be in the kingdom of God. It's not the circumstances around us. It's who we are that gets us through those things that will pass through this veil of tears. Here's a wonderful recipe, a wonderful solution. If we actually apply them, they're, right, they're real, they work, if we actually do it. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. To actually let God have your problems and be thankful. Then it says, and the peace of God, which passes all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We get this one plus one equals two. One plus one equals two. You do what this is talking about. And then it's not, you might have peace. If you can truly release your heart and give the things to the Lord with thankfulness, it says, and the peace of God which passes, surpasses all comprehension might guard your hearts and minds. Is that what it says? It says if you will do these things, if you truly can be thankful, trust in the Lord, go to the Lord, rest in the Lord. This is why the world is in such chaos today. This is why the devils seem to be controlling so many people today. Because they're not actually applying these simple things to their lives. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You want to be of a sound mind? You want to be of a peaceful heart? Right here is how you do it. Then it says, finally, brethren, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. It is so easy for us to dwell on the negatives. That's why there's a news business, because people... Our tendency is to dwell on the negative and the bad. We hear it. It's all around us. But the problem is, is when we hear it, we don't just let it go and thank the Lord for the good. We dwell on it. We think about it. We let it just get in and mess us up real good. If we would spend as much time dwelling on whatever is good and lovely, peace, joy, all of those 
blessings that are all around us, then we could have a sound mind and peace that passes all understanding. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. May the Lord add his blessings to his words. May we apply them to our hearts, minds. God bless you all. See you all next week, Lord willing. Oh, now.